welcome you to this webinar on addiction, affect regulation and attachment uh, treatment and in particular soothe, contain and move on tonight. So, so welcome and let's get started. There, as I was preparing for this, there's a whole lot of information that uh, I, I, I want to sort of put out there that might just uh, whet your appetite, especially if you're in recovery yourself. Hopefully it'll be informative and hopefully it's some of the things you've already picked up if you've been through treatment with us. So let's get underway. Um, a little bit of housekeeping, uh, we're, for you that uh, might be catching us online, South Pacific's here to help uh, people with any form of mental health or addiction issues. We're, we work off a, uh, a developmental immaturity model by PM Melody in the Meadows. We've been going 21 years and uh, at, at our um, intake department will answer any uh, calls or inquiries. So please, um, if you are hearing this webinar either live now or after the fact, please contact us if you hear anything tonight that could be helpful towards recovery and some of the issues you've got. So tonight we're going to look at and I'm going to share some uh, insights into the, the model of developmental immaturity that we use here at South Pacific Private. I'm going to share some new and effective techniques in affect regulation that we use at South Pacific Private with uh, patients who are in crisis and some sort of contextual summation of reality for patients in crisis in terms of their body, their thoughts, uh, feelings and behaviour. So we'll just we'll just move on into that. One of the things I like to start webinars with is uh, I, I'm an um, unashamed devotee of Pia Melody. I, I, I um, have um, used her model to understand my own life and recovery and I certainly uh, like listening to her even to this day that uh, that I can listen to uh, to her uh, presentations and one of the things Pia Melody says on her Mapping Your Recovery MP3 is she thanks people for turning up because if we don't and she's not joking it's 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 uh, I think the M Scott Peck said that uh, that mental health is a commitment to reality at all costs so when we finally make it to South Pacific Private we're usually in some sort of crisis some sort of unmanageability <coughs> excuse me and we've got some relational issues so just turning up can take a lot and be present, to turn up and tell the truth, to let someone really know what's going on. Then she talks about that we need to, to make that decision to grow up and that will make more sense as we talk about the developmental immaturity, the impact of trauma and then start to face our reality and in particular when Pia Melody talks about our reality, it's that holistic uh, approach to reality, our, our body, our thoughts, our feelings and our behaviour and how we experience ourselves in relationship to the world. So, so so, so to get well and to get into recovery, that's what it takes. I always start with this slide because this slide is, is our version of Pia Melody's uh, uh, map to recovery. It outlines uh, in, in specifically what children need to develop uh, and, and to develop some of those core uh, principles that people need to, to, to function in the world regarding their self-esteem, their boundaries, their sense of reality, their needs and wants and then the resulting moderation and spontaneity that people can have when they're functioning well. And then tonight what we're looking at specifically is that bottom blue corner in the second column is what happens when there's a lack of nurturing, trauma or abuse that interfere with what we now know is so essential to, to growth and development, um, especially in that, those first four years of life. I, I uh, was uh, moved by a, a Dr. John Toussaint, who's a, a, a practitioner out of, uh, I do believe, Sturt University uh, at a conference recently. We talked about the importance uh, relating to Dr. Alan Shaw's work of the, the importance of the first four years of life before your third birthday. And so t tonight we're going to look at some of the affect regulation issues that come out of experiencing that developmental trauma and for you folks out there that suffer those that affect regulation issue at a, at a post-traumatic stress level, a development of trauma disorder level, we, we will hopefully talk a little bit about what's available out there in the community. We know that when we experience that interruption to healthy parenting that, that we start to come in contact with the wounded child concept of peer melody which, which I also see in the work of uh, Dr. Dan and Siegel, the, the, where we experience ourselves and, and our, our, our uh, messages to self around our value, we're going to feel less than, too vulnerable, bad and flawed, really dependent and needy and life at that point will feel out of control and if we have real affect regulation issues at this level, we will feel literally out of control in, in our experience of self internally and it reflects uh, the, how we felt, the felt sense of ourself in those um, 
problematic developmental times, but we'll also learn, especially from about four onwards, uh, the, to, to develop an adaption to that family system. So we don't thrive, but we learn to survive. And depending on the family system and how we were parented, we'll work out ways to address those issues, but it, it, we end up living in extremes, feeling, act, feeling better than to cover up less than, invulnerable to cover up too vulnerable, bad, like good and perfect, or, or that sort of, I don't care, rebellion to act out the, the, the bad and flawed of the wounded child and will become anti-dependent and therefore uh, trying to create the myth we're in control. When Dan Siegel talks about affect regulation, he talks about the the the, the flight, sorry, the freeze and faint version of uh, affect dysregulation as as a as a chaos. And I always seem to to, to see that in Pia Melody's wounded child uh, description. And then when she uh, he Dan Siegel talks about the um, fight and flight mechanism, he talks about going into rigidity and I see a lot of themes with Pia Melody's adult adapted child and that rigidity that can be experienced in that limbic fight flight reaction. Now when you've got those two extremes, we are going to see symptoms of that in our adult life. Now depending on genetic predispositions and the, the, the genealogy of the family, uh, access and opportunity to uh, to addictive behaviours, uh, we, we, we are going to see those secondary symptoms develop. As a result of those uh, primary symptoms and secondary symptoms, that bottom paragraph of the uh, the secondary and relational problems really sticks out for me. Untreated primary symptoms lead to secondary symptoms, resulting in current crisis, unmanageability and intimacy issues. And therein lies the problem. So what we're going to talk about tonight is a little bit about understanding that problem better and, and then how to move into that functional adult, that where, where through treatment, recovery, intimacy and reparenting, we develop those functional adult skills, which will include if we've got that post-traumatic stress uh, due to complex childhood trauma, then, then, it, then it's going to include some of these affect regulation skills. Pia talks about the two recoveries. Firstly, from our secondary symptoms, our addictions, our obsessional and compulsional disorders. Uh, and then secondly, from our history, from this developmental trauma. Now what we know when people come into recovery, especially in SPP, if you come into the inpatient system, you leave your guns at the door. You'll, you'll, you'll leave alcohol and social media and sex addictions and money addictions and all of those obsessional and compulsional disorders, you're invited to leave them at the door. We know that people sometimes out of fear and desperation try and sneak stuff in, but we, but we do know that, that, that generally um, that the uh, people that have that desire to, to, to come in and, and leave those outside. Then we know that the developmental trauma is going to be triggered because you're, you're letting go of those, those medicating behaviours, so we become quite raw. We're at the very least going to see the adult adapted child in our defence mechanisms and we're definitely going to see that wounded child eventually come through. And it depends on, on just how much unmanageability and crisis you're in. I know Pia Melody, sometimes she jokes on the mapping your recovery uh, resource when she says that there was a fellow approached her at a conference and said, look, I've been beaten around the bushes looking for this wounded child and I can't find the wounded child and he said, stop looking, you're it. And sometimes in recovery we come in and we are that felt sense, we're in that chaos and we're in that uh, that, that that real overwhelm uh, that comes in that wounded child felt sense. And for other folks, they come in and their AAC is the most present sense of self that they've got. Their defences and they're better than and they're trying to be in control even in treatment. And so our, our hope is through primary group and changes that people get connected to that vulnerability. Now addiction, we do know, and, and, and the work of Dr. Patrick Carnes in regards to process addictions and uh, chemical addictions, uh, as some of you might know, we've, we've really just re our, uh, our approach to sex, love and avoidance addiction here at SPP and we're offering some day programs and some inpatient breakout groups reflecting uh, uh, Patrick's work. But essentially he talks about with, with uh, any sort of chemical addiction, it's a pathological relationship to uh, a a mood, uh, a mood changing chemical, but with uh, the process addiction, so for folks out there addicted to uh, gambling or money or food or sex, uh, and we use the, 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 the word addiction not from the diagnostic criteria of our, uh, our, our measuring tools that, that our psychiatrists use, but from the Webster's uh, dictionary sense uh, definition of addiction. Um, 
that we're looking at process addictions as a pathological relationship with a mood altering behaviour. So we do know that, that addiction in action changes the way the brain works, it changes the way it forms neural pathways, uh, it, 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 it triggers the same arousal templates in the brain as, as, as uh, outlined by Dr. Patrick Carnes. And he very much says, therefore, addictions are interactive. And we see this here at South Pacific all the time. People come in with one addiction, but by the time they leave, they've got two or three. And in actual fact, in the research over 40 years by Dr. Patrick Carnes, 87% of people with one addiction will definitely find evidence of obsessional compulsions in two or more other addictions when they're in treatment. So the recovery one from a developmental trauma, and I, I started to explore this today because I do know that the DSM-5 is out, and so what are we talking about with the developmental trauma? Pia Melody got very interested in this early on. She, she got very curious, firstly to, to get well herself, but also working with clients at the Meadows. And, and, and so I suppose at South Pacific Private, we define uh, the, the developmental trauma is, is a physical, sexual, emotional, intellectual, or spiritual abuse, enmeshment or abandonment as parenting styles, and when a client experiences these in their developmental years, that this affects the brain's chemistry and can predispose us to addictions and compulsions. And we know now that that early childhood development, that the brain uh, forms uh, more superior pathways when it's in a safe environment. And what we know is when someone's experiencing ongoing developmental trauma, the, 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 the fears and the, the chemicals in the brain that the brain starts to develop in is are under stress. And so we, we, they, they don't form in that superior uh, format. Now, now in saying that, uh, I I explain myself, I'm a psychotherapist, I've been working in this field now uh, for 27 years, I'm 29 years in, in, in continuous recovery from drugs and alcohol. Uh, I, I am an enthusiast when it comes to the brain science, but I'm not a scientist and you've always got to watch out when you're an enthusiast. The, the researchers out there get very disappointed with fellows like myself because we get really excited about stuff that they, they, they really see as the bricks and mortar of their work. But I think what I'm talking about when I, I look at this, this, what's in front of you there, is that it's, it, it is a revelation and an aha moment for people to come into treatment for, for an addiction that they're really feeling awful about the effects in their life. And then they start to dig deeper into what's motivating me. I'm, am I just a bad person? Is this a moral dilemma? And when we start to work with people at a developmental trauma level and they start to connect these dots, it's, it, it, it explains an awful amount to folks that they're feeling now that they're a sick person trying to get well, not a bad person trying to get good. So this, this, uh, some of the things I want to share with you is, well, where are we at these days with trauma? So in the DSM-5, the definition and the changes are we're, we're getting better at, uh, at understanding the, the affect dysregulation that comes with childhood trauma. Now, in regards to post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, and, and this is where we have a shock uh, occurrence in our adult life. We, they've, they've moved it in its category, and I think this is interesting, from an anxiety disorder to a trauma and stressor related disorder. We're not far away from being able to, to call this a, a developmental trauma disorder. I think in the, the next edition or two, we will start to see that the, the symptoms we see at South Pacific from developmental trauma uh, are, can be different than what you're just about to, to hear me say. But generally, what we're looking at is a, that we can have PTSD, uh, directly experience a, the, a traumatic event ourselves. we can witness a traumatic event in person, or we learn that a traumatic event has occurred to some close family member or close friend with the actual or threatened death being either violent or accidental, uh, uh, or the trauma being violent or accidental. Uh, and, and we can experience firsthand repeated or extreme exposure to adverse details of a traumatic event. Uh, and so this can be people that, uh, that work in the uh, frontline service services of police or ambulances, or crisis care, uh, counsellors uh, that deal with uh, chronic abuse and trauma. So this is post-traumatic stress which can happen to folks in their adult life due to an adult trauma. 
Now, when we look for complex PTSD in the DSM-5, we don't, they, 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 they've, they've moved away from that, but we know that they're still looking at it in the ICD-11. So what's the difference? So what we're looking at, what we look at as, as a complex PTSD at South Pacific is for folks that have had ongoing trauma from their developmental years. And why we call it, the, the, have the post-traumatic stress as a title is because we see a lot of similar themes. So it's a persistent and, and pervasive impairment into each of the following. So we'll have affective functioning and dysregulation issues. We'll have heightened emotional activity. There can be violent outbursts, tendency to, towards disassociated states when under stress. Uh, in regards to self-functioning, persistent beliefs about oneself as diminished or defeated or worthless, pervasive feelings of shame and guilt. And so uh, very much so, if you take your mind back to that model and the wounded child, you'll, you'll see that around the self-esteem issues, the sense of self, the, the toxic level of feelings around shame and guilt especially, and we'll see relational functioning difficulties in sustaining relationships or feeling close to others. So if you're mindful, untreated primary symptoms lead to secondary symptoms resulting in unmanageability crisis and relational issues. So when we, we look at these modern definitions, you'll find them very much in the model that we use at South Pacific. Now, now, where what didn't get into the DSM this time round was Dr. Bessel van der Kolt and, and, uh, and the committee that were that had put forward a definition for developmental trauma disorder. Now, this didn't get in, but I suppose the reason I mention it, the papers available online under that title uh, of towards a, a rational diagnosis for children with complex trauma histories. This is a. a, 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 a a paper that you can get and read yourself. So if you've got developmental trauma, I would really recommend uh, the the work of uh, of Bessel. Uh, the, the picture you'll see there is we were, Bessel of Anticult just attended a, a conference in Australia and, and we were really happy to go and uh, participate and, and, and be part of that because as a, as a service, uh, this this emerging belief of uh, a new diagnosis is something that we've been working with for 21 years, and and so please check that out. His book, uh, the the most recent book of his is called The Body Keeps the Score, and I'll explain what that title really means as we go through it. But essentially, he's saying that there's a serious move now from talk-related therapies to body-focused therapies in regards to dealing with developmental trauma, uh, to which we call complex PTSD at this moment. So, uh, making statistics meaningful, what, what, what are we looking at here? Now, the biggest study that happened was the Adverse Childhood Experience Study. Seven and a half thousand people were, were, were looked at in a study by the Department of D Disease in America. And, and some, some alarming statistics come out. As a, as a parent, as a, as a parent myself, that, that my children, the most dangerous person in their life can be me. 80% of people that experienced adverse childhood experiences uh, received them from inside the family home. So it, it, if you're someone in recovery that's got rage issues and stress issues, it's our model's a very hard one to, to not see both sides of the stick, that I, I come from a family system where there was trauma, but I can be in the middle of creating one too. So that's what's so essential that I need to reparent me so I can be better at parenting others. And so tra and traumatic childhood experiences are not only extremely common, but they have a profound impact on the different areas of functioning for children. And what happens if that remains unconscious in a family system, children start to turn up in therapist's office and doctor's offices for oppositional defiance disorders and different diagnoses that try and just encapsulate the symptoms people are experiencing. And yet underneath that, well, you know, these folks then find themselves in their adult life in treatment centres like ours, and they're looking at developmental trauma. So I suppose we're trying to, at South Pacific, at one of our sayings here is to to change the family legacy, and and so part of that is is noting that that if I've experienced developmental trauma, then I'm likely to go on and in my own life experience depression, suicide attempts, alcoholism, drug abuse, sexual promiscuity, domestic violence, a nicotine addiction, obesity, physical inactivity, and sexually transmitted diseases. All those things were seen as the result of developmental trauma in the general population. And I think the most alarming was uh, the, the, uh, the, the thing that Pia Melody says about this model too is it results in early death. You live in this much stress uh, for that long, then, then eventually our lifespan is in jeopardy. 
So when we're working with trauma, what are some of the things that we know now that, that, that really cre are necessary to create really healthy environments to start dealing with trauma? Now we've got uh, at the moment a, our, our post-traumatic stress program as a day program and our uh, open and now we've got a closed uh, group which some of these things were, are what we share in those groups as, as a basic working principle and we've believed this here at South Pacific for a long time. I know that uh, Lorraine Wood, the, the uh, owner and founder of South Pacific, has a couple of real bumper stickers I've always cherished. One is, is that we've got to create a, 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 a safe environment for every client that walks into South Pacific private to the best of our ability and then once someone's here is give them a good experience of recovery and I know what she means by that because we got well in Codependence Anonymous in the 80s and at that time walking into those meetings you were welcomed, it was safe and, and the environment itself led to the new neural pathways being superiorly formed because we, we, were, we were growing in safety and, 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 and you'll see that the first stage of trauma therapy involves creating physical and emotional safety, uh, that we need to get educated, we need some good education on, about trauma responses in the body so we can uh, understand better flashbacks and disassociation because when that happens to you, it's like your body's hijacking you and, 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 and so these are the, the, we need some good education about what's happening and I'll go over some of that as we go through this. We need to understand and learn to regulate emotions. We can be very disconnected when we come into treatment, especially if we've got adult uh, uh, signs of addiction or just obsessional and compulsional behaviours to medicate how we feel. Uh, managing trauma responses using uh, pharmacotherapy, so we will, especially in South Pacific, look and see is there any way that there's someone might need to and benefit from some pharmacotherapy earlier on, uh, with the goal really to be drug free as we go through, but, 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 but we have that benefit and blessing here at SPP being a psychiatric hospital with some of the wonderful psychiatrists we have here and the GPs that can help us in our therapeutic journey. Essential to start immediately learning relaxation, mindfulness and grounding techniques. I had the uh, privilege this week of being published by the Australian Childhood uh, on this, this model, Soothe, Contain, Move On, and, and a little bit of the journey of how it got created here. Uh, and they held the best conference I, I've seen in Australia to date on childhood trauma and uh, dealing with developmental trauma. Dr. Alan Shaw, Dan Siegel, Ed Tronic, Stephen Porges were all there, Pat Ogden, uh, were, were just to name a few, uh, were there uh, and sharing that, that just how important early on I, that mindfulness and relaxation and learning to ground ourselves is. I'll talk a little bit about that as we go through this webinar. And then at the bottom there it talks about some of those therapies that are on the fringe a little. Uh, one of the latest uh, uh, YouTube uh, uh, talks that Bessel van der Kolk gives, he talks very powerfully and he's researched EMDR, even though the, the, the EMDR uh, as, a, as a treatment uh, is still one that, that, that people don't exactly know how it works on, on, on relieving ourselves of these symptoms, we get the end result of it working and he's done some research on using EMDR and Prozac and placebos and, and the EMDR therapies uh, and, uh, and I've mentioned radical exposure therapies, therapies that go to the body and desensitise us are getting uh, uh, much better results than some of the older more recognised therapies such as CBT, especially for affect regulation and developmental trauma. So, so starting to, uh, we, we do know now at South Pacific when people come in and they get diagnosed with complex PTSD that we will refer you on to a trauma focused therapist which could use one or a few of these techniques. The second stage is uncovering and remembering and mourning, modifying and processing memories of traumatic events. So it's a very interesting process, this idea of grieving uh, uh, and, and processing traumatic memories, especially developmental trauma. When Pia Melody uh, wrote Facing Codependence, The Intimacy Factor and uh, Facing Love Addiction, but in particular the facing codependence, when she talks about dealing with childhood trauma, she talks about grieving. 
you grieve what you got and you grieve what you didn't get. But to do that, you've got to get back and 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 have a clearer understanding of your story, your narrative. What uh, you know, and she points out very clearly that the very thing our brain uses to help us survive those traumatic events is something that that hinders us in early recovery because we're used to minimising our past. We're used to uh, having sort of delusions and denials about some of the things that we have. And for some folks, there's absolute memory loss due to disassociation when the events happened. So, so when we're talking about uncovering, remembering and mourning, uh, this is not just, uh, uh, we, we, I mentioned CBT there because we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Learning how some of these beliefs and, and, and esteem messages impact how we feel is very important. And, it, and CBT can still be a very helpful tool. However, when we've got as our earliest defences, suppression, repression or disassociation, and then in our adult life, uh, we have uh, a minimisation, denial, delusion and memory loss, then we're not necessarily going to remember this story. And in Breaking Free, the workbook that goes with facing codependence, Pia Melody uh, outlined that there's two ways back it to to getting this data and it's through the body and it's through the feeling states, the emotional states, the felt sense in the body. Now what I'm going to share with you as we go through this is just how much this field has grown and its understanding of that. And so when we look at uh, the the EMDR, the eye, eye desensitization uh, therapies, uh, we, we also look at the body psychotherapies uh, that we can use at this stage. And in our closed group, uh, our therapist uh, uh, Tash is, is, is using these, these uh, sensory uh, body focused therapies now to work uh, the work of uh, Peter Levine and Pat Ogden, uh, it, 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 the, the, the model there I mentioned, the, the SIBAM model, the sensation, image, behaviour, affect, meaning, uh, the work of Peter Levine, not going just to the story but how is that story stored in our body, what sort of sensations do we have and in focusing and just really being in that experience and bringing that out in, in, a, in, a, in a body focused focused therapy uh, un unlocks what our CBT or our cognition can't seem to access. And so we really look at this second stage of uh, trauma focused therapy about focusing on the body versus talk therapy. And at the bottom there I mentioned TRE, that's trauma release exercise and trauma focused yoga. Uh, Dr. Bessel van der Kolk at his trauma centre in Boston, Massachusetts has done a lot of research and study on, on how uh, really being, uh, not just being body focused in our approach to the therapy, but also using uh, the, the trauma release exercises to access how the body is uh, trapped in the, the, the stress of the trauma or using trauma focused yoga to sort of release and, and work with those sensations is, is two uh, tools at the moment that, that are getting very good results in treatment. And then the third one's looking and reconnecting and addressing life issues. And these uh, six uh, things that you'll see here, or well, five really, uh, 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 really reflect uh, Patrick Carnes' 30 point recovery plan that once we start this work, what's really important, and Pia Melody said if you can sum up her model in two words, it's connection, disconnection and, and connection, that, that, that the functional adult's about getting connected again. So getting into recovery isn't just focusing on releasing this trauma. It, it's got to translate into a life change, so improving relationships, and sometimes that's just with your peer group, with people in your group, with your therapist, but we're rebuilding from, a, from the safest uh, connections we have and then out into our greater life, work, and not just going back, to, you know, working in an environment that's, that's, that's healthy and, and altruistic and, and can be life-giving or, or creating a, even a work without pay, uh, uh, involving something in your life that's meaningful, reconnections to family and not just family of origin but family of choice and family of creation and then involving some sort of spiritual practice in your life whether it be mindfulness or meditation or returning back to a, a religion uh, that, that, that is one that you practice or works for you and then looking at that recreational uh, uh, recreational sort of aspect to your life, creating some fun and spontaneity again will all be things as a, as a third stage, a really uh, not just just relieving the symptoms but reconnecting with your life in a much more meaningful way.
So, so with uh, this this uh, this this recovery map, it's uh, usually an early recovery. People feel really overwhelmed, and Pia doesn't. Pia really uh, highlights that. She, she her phrase for recovery and early recovery is trudging the road to your happy destiny. And so, if you feel overwhelmed, this map is one of those maps that goes out. They they talk about recovery coming in in layers, like the the layers of an onion being peeled back. And and from the latter, that that if you follow this thing from the top down, we're going to have these sin syndromes of shame, our addictions and medicative behaviours and underneath that when you peel that layer off and get into sobriety and recovery, you're going to see those old uh, adapted adult children behavioural cover-ups, our defence mechanisms. When we start to address those and be more in our functional space, we're going to see those family roles that get triggered in our relationships and getting clear and aware of what they are and which role I might be in and, 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 and sometimes in families we can have a, a variety of roles and just learn learning how they get triggered and activated and under that is where we find those really clear and organic defences. What are we getting back to that sense of self and I'll talk a little bit about that as we move on because for folks with post-traumatic stress disorder as we get closer to that core of self, as John Bradshaw said, it's, in, it's the intolerable experience of being when we're shame based. So, so if, if you're out there and you're, you're in early recovery or that first year or two and you're in that struggle of, of getting Getting to know yourself, I, I, I sometimes put this this slide up homeopathically to sort of say, well, look, it, it's it's because this is a big job we're undertaking, but yet if we can get to that core self and start to heal from that trauma, then let, we really do unlock that that ability to have a life better than we've ever known. So the the, the reality, if the, the the first slide I showed you is I've got to turn up, grow up, and I've got to get in touch with my reality. Uh, Scott Peck, uh, good mental health is is uh, is, is a, a commitment to reality at all costs. So so with the work I'm talking about here is that in the CBT model we talk about taking in things from outside of ourselves. We take it in as data through the embodied brain. We 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 get all our Nervous system data then feeds us things from our history, our learning experiences, our beliefs, and we'll sign a meaning. That 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 felt sense and that feeling comes up that that's from our our stored memory banks, and then we'll choose a behaviour. But what happens in PTSD is we get hijacked. That that we can be going along, living life normally, but then something happens and it triggers us into an into a an awful response where we where if you could go back to that slide about the the uh, the affect dysregulation happens relationally we can be really triggered inside of our own body we we, we really start to suffer uh, and and we can go offline and we'll notice that 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 at a at a felt sense will we, our, our limbic system uh, will will fire and we lose that executive functioning from our frontal cortex. We'll, we'll, we'll go into a fight, flight, freeze response. And at this point, we, we're losing control of our senses. And this is where it can be really confusing when you get into recovery. And for addicts out there, it, it, it makes a lot of sense of why I really need to medicate this system because I don't want this to happen. I want to medicate myself away from it and desensitize my body so this stuff doesn't get triggered. That's why when you're an addict, it can be a real blessing to find an addiction that works if you've got PTSD from complex childhood trauma because it just shuts you down. But it comes back to us. You can't outrun your pathology. It'll come back to us. And so I want to talk a little little bit about this fight, flight, freeze response and the, the way it can get triggered. So with our body, this reality issues and addiction, this, aff this affect dysregulation. So when we when we take in and experience a trigger, well then we can go into this 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 complex reaction. And I'm going to explain this polyvagal theory by Dr. Stephen Porges in a second. So we can already at a physical level uh, get really derailed from the bottom of our brain up. We can we can react and we lose that executive functioning, like I said. For any addicts out there that we're already in a state of rawness due to our withdrawal uh, and that we look at the post-withdrawal, uh, post-acute withdrawal syndrome here at South Pacific where the first six weeks we can have, uh, we're not talking just about the chemical withdrawal but, uh, because the half-life of drugs can be quite short but, but we're talking about the impact on our brain as it recalibrates and, and therefore the impact on the felt sense of uh, our experience of life. So in early recovery you can be doing all the right things in your recovery but feeling awful for some time. So at a physical level we're quite powerless over that. 
In regards to our thinking, we can have lots of cognitive distortions and defences, especially when something has been triggered around a, a, a previous trauma. So if you've grown up with developmental trauma, what seems to be one of those phenomenons, we, we are attracted to what's familiar. So all of a sudden we've grown up with domestic violence and here we are with an inner partner that's, uh, that's being domestically violent to us. We uh, grow up in an alcoholic family home and even if we're not an alcoholic ourselves, we end up in relationships with addicts who are acting out and we're recreating that stress and re-triggering that trauma. So we really start to uh, look at, well, what are the, how have I made that possible? Why am I not seeing this? Because it can be quite a blind spot for people to not see that, uh, that they've got a lot of uh, distorted thinking. And some of the, 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 the little inverted commas I've put in there, uh, what I like about the Alcoholics Anonymous program, especially when we're looking at, at, at keeping addiction simple in the beginning, I'm not just powerless over the alcohol if I'm an alcoholic, but I can be powerless over the, tr the way that people, places or things can trigger me. I'm also powerless over some of those first thoughts that arrive. My 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 most uh, dominant neuro pathways are going to be that 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 old thinking. And I I heard a fellow once that uh, that uh, started a rehab in the city say that he he thought addiction was the first thought wrong disease, and that in recovery we need to pause when we get that initial uh, sort of instinct to just act and just check if this is in our best interest. Is this our best? thinking and that old phrase, the bumper sticker from AA, stinking thinking leads to drinking. If we don't check it and start to become conscious, we'll just continue to act out in that old familiar way. The feeling and learning to feel in recovery, uh, I think it's a lot harder than it sounds. You know, when we come to treatment, uh, there's an, uh, there was a saying here at South Pacific by a fellow a psych, a psychologist called Jonathan Black. He said, we come to treatment to feel better, uh, but we, we need to actually get better at feeling. Uh, and that can, you can feel ripped off with that in early recovery. It's like, I just want to feel better, and yet I come here and I've got to get better at feeling. I've got to learn how to have these feelings in my body and not be derailed. And then for folks that have post-traumatic stress, when we do get derailed through fight, flight, and freeze, I've got to learn how to regulate my state. Otherwise, I'm going to I'm going to be in this. I'm going to be a victim to that trauma way past the impact of the trauma. Now, in regards to behaviour, what's really interesting in, in, is that change is behavioural. To start a change, we can't wait to feel like doing it. We can't wait to really have a really cemented strong thoughts about it, we, but we can change a behaviour. And some of the things with Soothe Contain move on, and one of the things Stephen Porches says is that just that mechanical act of really focusing on and regulating our breathing has an enormous uh, impact on our viscera, our state. And so I'll talk about that in a second, but change is behavioural, and we cannot afford to wait to feel better to change our behaviour. We must change that behaviour to feel better. And an example of that with post-traumatic stress would be, well, I've got a, I've got a go to my therapy and I've got to turn up and sort of go to the edge of that discomfort and learn these regulation techniques versus just avoiding it or medicating it through any form of addiction. So the polyvagal theory, like I steered you towards Bessel van der Kolk, I, I wholeheartedly steer you towards Dr. Stephen Porges, and he has studied as a psychiatrist the impact of the, 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 the different ways that the triune brain, the three parts of our brain, impact our, our state if we've experienced trauma. So according to the polyvagal theory, the growth of the autonomic nervous system evolves through three stages. So the, 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 the lowest part of the brainstem, the freeze mechanism, is a primitive, unmyelinated visceral vagus. It's a nerve that fosters digestion, responds to threat by depressing the metabolic activity. It's the freeze response. So for you folks out there that, that notice that when you're under enormous stress or get triggered, that you just shut down and you can really hate yourself after this because you go offline. It's when we know that at that at a developmental trauma level, we've absolutely been impacted at a point where we were unable to fight back. And and so it's very dangerous this uh, for uh, for Homo sapiens because we need at least over 20% of our our lung capacity, our oxygen, just to get our brain to function. So so when we go into this state, it's very dangerous, uh, and, and and we we need to learn to regulate, get back to congruence, so we can 
will uh, uh, not be, get, get damaged by, by this freeze response. The next response, is, they talk about the polyvagal theory is the fight flight, the mobilization of flight and fight is dependent on the functioning of the sympathetic nervous system. It increases that metabolic output and, and, and it and inhibiting this visceral vagus nerve. So what it does is it fosters mobilization. We go into fight and flight. If I'm either going to get out of here and if I can't get out of here, I'm going to take you on. And for a lot of folks, when this is developmentally trauma created, then it's a relational trigger that's going to trigger it. So this part of our brain was there to save our lives if we saw a bear or we, we, saw, had, we experienced a life-threatening situation. It gives that energy to, to, to sort of save ourselves. Uh, but, but if this gets triggered relationally in the lounge room, next thing you know, we're physically acting out or whether we're, we're either escaping the relationship or we're really acting out with, with uh, we're, we're taking, a, in layman's terms, a bazooka to a knife fight where we're, we're absolutely uh, over-energized and can create incredible damage to ourselves and others. The third part, and this is when we grow up in a fairly functional system, this, this, this third uh, uh, stage of this polyvagal theory is, is where we notice uh, uh, this mammalian myelinated vagus. So in other words, it's, a, it's the part of our executive functioning that learns to regulate these impulsive triggers that come from the bottom of the brain up. So when this works, it's sort of like the, I'm a layman, as I said, I'm an enthusiast and there's probably scientists right now listening to this, uh, thinking, what is this guy talking about? But how I understand it is that's that part of me that can regulate that, that impulse and instincts as they come up. And if I'm in functioning well, I'm able to sort of handbrake that, regulate that and, and adjust myself. And it also, this, this particular nerve, the way that we stay regulated is you'll notice it in, in the way that we... Uh, uh, are able to relate socially through the way uh, the, the face, uh, the way the tone of the voice is. It, it's it's um, a way that, especially if you're a therapist working with trauma, when it's important that we focus on having a really good ability to regulate and it's usually that tone of the voice and the, uh, the, the orbital nerves and the, 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 the is, is what we'll, we'll notice when someone's really regulated. When we have got developmental trauma, this is the part of us that, as Dan Siegel says, with that hand model of the brain, we flip our lid and we lose this ability to regulate. So those fight, flight and freeze reactions become our dominant response, which can be very disorientating. So as Stephen says, is the simple mechanical change of breathing increases the calming impact and the health benefits of the myelinated vagus in our body. So in other words, if, if, if I can start to regulate just through that mechanical change in breathing, we see it has an enormous benefit really simply. And so when we get triggered into the, either that danger or life, life, life threat and our nervous system is, 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 uh, is limbically acting out, what really struck me about this sentence from his book was that if I can just, through that simple mechanical change, regulate myself, I can bring that, my executive functioning back online. And, and, and so this prompted this, this idea about the Sooth container and move on. So please, by all means, if this is resonating with you, look up Stephen Porges' polyvagal theory. So, soothe, contain, move on. What is it? If I stay within the framework of developmental trauma with Pia Melody's model, and it's noticing that whenever I get into that freeze uh, reaction, I saw that very much align, like I said, Dan Siegel's version of going into chaos with the wounded child. And we go into that freeze mechanism. And so our, our, our uh, uh, nervous system shuts down. And so one of the things that we know is going to talk therapy, it, it can have a positive impact, especially if you're really regulated. I know over the years when I've worked here and clients have been under stress, I'd hear the, 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 the intercom go, Steve, go to the nurse's station, and someone would be stressed. Now, before I knew anything about Stephen Porges and Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, I used to go down there and I'd, I'd assess the situation. If someone was really distressed and collapsed or in a fetal position, I'd really, I'd lower 
of the tone of my voice, I'd be very safe, I'd sit at a distance, it felt intuitively and organically okay with me. Sometimes it might be a therapeutic touch, I'd just to get them grounded, might touch the top of their forearm, always letting them know. Uh, we'd make sure that they've got, they can breathe and then we'd just start to gently get them focusing on their breath and of course, as Stephen said, that simple mechanical change, people came online. So I suppose what we know now with the wounded child and with this information that the neuroscientists and the psychiatrists are sharing with us is, is that if I can just get someone grounded, I can get that breathing and that congruence with the heart rate and the breath and their brain functioning again, I can soothe somebody and bring their stress down, creating a sense of safety. So the idea of the butterfly hands is something that you'll see Dan Siegel talk about, Dr. Peter Levine talk about, it's a grounding technique. It's just literally as the, as, as the image shows, just resting gently over your chest area so it's over the top of your lungs and then over your diaphragm and just that, that sense the connection with your pinky and your thumb, just like a little brace position and then we will focus on the breath with you. Now this is a technique that we hope that when someone's stressed they learn to use themselves but while we're here I say look make us work for you, if you're at South Pacific, I've really wanted this tool to be able to be used by any one of our staff members that could see a distressed person and say look let me just sit with you and, and, and sit across with you and practice this to the best of our ability and it just takes 10 deep uh, mechanical breaths, we focus on the mechanics. And then the suds, I'll, the slide for the suds is coming up, but this, it's just a subjective units of distress. Uh, what's, what, what I know with developmental trauma myself and my own healing and working with others, I'm a really bad judge. I'm a, ha I'm a cup half empty guy. So when I'm trying to measure if I'm stressed or not, uh, uh, I was, uh, to, to use a really silly reference, but I remember seeing, a, a, for any of you older folks out there, a version of Happy Days with uh, Richie Cunningham and he found a medical doctor's book and the whole episode was about him reading it in his closet and realising he, he thought he had every symptom that was in it. So I think when, when if I'm left to my own devices and you ask me how I'm feeling, if I'm really worried, I'm more worried than I really am. When someone goes to this sort of offline dysregulated state, the, 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 the only thing I can really check in with someone is, is at a naught to 10, 10 being the most awful you feel and not, not being feeling wonderful, where are you right now? And sometimes someone can usually say a 9 or an 8 or a 7 and, and they don't have to put much thought into it because it's not measured by anything else other than their own reference. Now I won't bring that in immediately but once someone starts to get grounded, I'll just check out how stressed are you now because that comes in handy as we get grounded, feel safer, come Come back online, and that's why that's a question there. Am I, you know, the idea of I am safe is like I'm going to create a safe environment to bring you back online. And so, as someone's sort of checking in, it's an affirmation: I am safe. I'm here. I'm okay. Because what happens with post-traumatic stress is I'm reliving the moment now. This isn't a history lesson. We're not remembering back. The way I experience my state, right? I'm there. I'm there now and this dysregulation is happening now. One of the people I love that works with uh, this level of distress, uh, Dan Siegel, he talks about in, in his own lectures, his uh, first day at work as a, uh, a registered doctor and he talks about uh, this uh, really dramatic account of walking into a ward and being pulled under a bed and a veteran was there and really struggling and suffering and in the moment, in the back in the trench, right there, right now, they were living that moment right there, right now. It's not a history lesson. Their, their, their state, their, their cognitive distortions, the way that they're literally uh, are reacting inside of them, they're reliving that moment. So our idea here is when we go into that freeze or faint mode to bring the oxygen up, the simple mechanical act of breathing, start that regulation uh, technique. Now this isn't, this isn't healing the trauma, this is soothing us to get us back online so we continue to be in recovery towards healing the trauma. Now the next one is when is, is the contain is, is more about that rigidity that can happen through the fight and flight. So, so what can happen then is we can get uh, really triggered and we go into an overreaction. One of the descriptions I use is if you grew up in a family system where there was a violent uh, rager with maybe an alcoholic person under distress and you're a little person that regularly got struck by a, by a hand that went up and came down, you're a little, say you're by the armchair and dad was a drinker and he would 
strike you and you never saw it coming. You might find yourself in Times Square, New York, having a wonderful time, first time overseas, everything's amazing, you're really in a lot of pleasure and joy, this is a trip of a lifetime, and then someone walks up beside you and raises their hand. And if you've got that post-traumatic stress reaction in your body, it's a stored felt sense, you could go into that freeze reaction I just talked about, or you could go into that fight and flight where you are, your adrenaline rushes and, and, and you might find yourself even striking the person, you might find yourself leaping away from them, and yet all they're doing is, a, is, a, is they're putting their arm up to flag a cab. And this is what I mean about it. When it happens relationally, we go into this overreaction and we'll get hypervigilant. And so what we're, what, we're, uh, what we're looking at, and folks, I'm just aware that we might have a uh, power issue here. So stay with us, folks, because um, we're, we're running out of power. So let's have a look at what's going on here. Um, so we're just say, folks, I'm going to do something really, we, are we there? We're plugged in but not charging. Okay. So we could have a battery problem. It's okay. I nearly panicked. I thought we we're going to go offline then, but, uh, but I'm okay now. <laughs> so this idea with the, the contain is we're going to have a hypervigilant. So you'll see that I notice, well, what is my reality right now? Because generally people are hypervigilant. I'll get them to check in with their body and we might still go to that, uh, the, the butterfly hands just to, to, to regulate the heart rate down a little and to get that breathing more deep because when we go into that hypervigilance we can go into that upper lung breathing and, and nearly what, what seems to mirror a panic attack, especially if we're flighting. And so we're trying to get that, that, that what is my reality right now, soothing that body, going to the body first and then trying to think what it, where possible if someone's online and, and then the next bit would be checking out what, what defences am I in right now, what thoughts have I got, what, how am I interpreting this reality, what feelings, what, what behaviours are there. We're just checking in where appropriate. But the main part of this is going to the body, soothing that body, bringing that heart rate down, and then once there's a little bit of calmness, what's, what, what, what defences just got triggered? What are my needs right now? What boundaries do I, do I might need to, to set to protect myself or contain myself? Doesn't mean this all goes away. I worked with a fellow once that was really distressed, got really triggered, and I remember sitting beside him and just asking him about his reality. He just said, look, I can't even speak right now. But, but, so I just sat there patiently, really working on regulating my own state and being peaceful until it, it, just to support him because he was in fight. And it was going to be a very dangerous time for him if that escalated. So just staying with him, really focusing on regulating myself and then working with him. And then as he calmed and came back online, we could talk about what got triggered and what's his needs right now. What's he need to do to protect or contain himself? Last but not least is, 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 is that idea of that moving on, is that my functional adult now starts to, I'm regulating my state, I'm aware of my suds, they're generally lower, I've got to remember to reparent myself, I can start to practice radical acceptance because a lot of the time when we go into this reaction, I can go into a lot of negative or, or critical self-talk, so that radical acceptance, the serenity prayer, and then turning into some gratitudes uh, as a way of then moving on. So this idea of just using soothe, contain, move on is not to shut us down, but to just try and get us back into a regulated state. As I said, it doesn't deal with healing the PTSD, but it is learning a regulation tool so when we get triggered, we just don't go offline. And I just wanted to show you at the, at the bottom of our resource here that, that idea of the suds of extreme anxiety down to feeling fairly peaceful and just learning how to rate it can be something that when I do it with a practitioner that's helpful, but then to also be able to do it on my own sometimes. I notice that online these days you can do the emotional freedom technique online and they'll do it with uh, uh, web, you can, you can get onto YouTube and practice it and it's a way of just l learning to bring our, our stress down in a measurable sense. So if it's a helpful tool, please, please have a look at that online and see. So essentially we're learning, we're, you know, we're learning how to regulate. So that soothe, contain, move on just pretty well is, is, is sort of letting us become our, our, our own interpersonal neurobiologist. Now this isn't to make light of science, but I just know that if you've got developmental trauma, complex PTSD, and even for our clients that come here with adult trauma, uh, adult PTSD, then learning how to regulate ourselves can become an aha moment. It, it, it's it's, it's get, giving your life back. Uh, 
because generally when we go into that, that those reactions that we're quite powerless over, uh, we can end up living in a lot of fear of it happening. So so that's where addictions or compulsive behaviours happen to regulate medicators. So this is about when you're in recovery, this is going to get triggered for you. So we, it's 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 starting to learn uh, that that this functional adult needs to learn to interpret when this is starting to get triggered and if we can start to tune into that, especially our body, we will start to notice the earlier signs that we're under stress or something's just rising, it's uh, rising, it's, uh, it's, it's, I was going to say ugly head because that's certainly what it feels like. So it's this reparent, this idea of reparenting that, that Pia says in a model that we need to, through treatment, recovery, intimacy, and reparenting, develop functional adult skills. Now I won't go too far into this, but it is that be uh, that there's a saying I like by uh, Ken Keys Jr. called uh, to to see your drama clearly is to be liberated from it. So the idea of reparenting is I learn to witness myself. I'm witnessing that wounded sense, and if I'm tuning into my reality, that turning up to my reality, then if if I've got post-traumatic stress from complex childhood abuse, if I can tune into what happens, what are the triggers that trigger me so I can be prepared and know uh, that I'm going to need extra support when I start to notice the felt sense. Uh, I was watching Peter Levine as he worked with his somatic uh, ex uh, expression therapies, his body focused therapies. He worked with a veteran. It's a wonderful YouTube video of his and uh, he works with a veteran and he has a, a tick in his jaw and he has a tick in the shaking of one of his hands. and he he just explains this this witnessing. He works with the veteran at a body at a body focused sensual experience where he he works on the tick and just just keeps him in his body without going to any version of the narrative of the trauma. So this is the healing. If I can start to tune in, it'll help me reach out for that support and be able to sort of regulate myself with some of the, uh, that simple mechanical act of breathing, regulating and, and, and giving myself that confidence that when I go into those triggers, I can learn affect regulation at depth. Now, now competencies for professionals. Uh, it, it's it's uh, what I've learned myself is I can't take uh, somebody. I can't take someone I'm working with somewhere I've not been willing to go myself. And and the the book The Mindful Therapist by Dr. Dan Siegel is a wonderful tool for therapists to really be present. Pack Pat Ogden's work uh, is very important in teaching a therapist that we do more by doing less if I can regulate and be present. And, and so if you've got post-traumatic stress from complex childhood abuse, please uh, look for therapists that are trauma-focused, that work not just with the talk therapies but to the body. And you might find that EMDR works or uh, neurofeedback works or trauma release experiences, uh, exercises work. It's, it's just really giving yourself that freedom to, to what's out there, what can I try that might work for me. To help someone regulate, we need to be regulated. So, if, you know, if you're with a therapist that's really stressed, when you get really triggered, that's probably less than helpful. Uh, practicing butterfly hands with them, I know that for me, it's it's helpful to do it with with folks and to be present, and and, and that also helps me regulate when I'm with someone under enormous stress. Uh, and being aware of our own reality in, in, when we're regulating. So what's happening for me? What am I transferring into the situation? And it allows us to sort of mirror and be the change that, that we're wanting you, you to experience when you're in that state. For ourselves, uh, as clients, it's like it's, it's really starting, as Pia Melody outlined all those years ago in Breaking Free, that the healing's going to come through the body and my feeling states. I'm not going to be able to think my way out of this. Now, as a, as a first child hero to a mentally ill mother that I was enmeshed with, I was hypervigilant and I tried to think my way into recovery, but our body will betray us. This trauma is stored in there and so eventually getting, it, getting into that felt sense and releasing it can be frightening but enormous enormously healing. Um, we grow through our awareness and, 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 and then we start to learn to meet our needs and wants and what I mean by that is that I, I, I am responsible in my functional adult to identify, to become aware of and appropriately meet my needs. If I've got post-traumatic stress uh, as, 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 as a reaction to my developmental trauma, then that's one of those needs I have to meet and I need professional help for that, I need support for that. 
So we're looking at that holistic change versus just abstinence. So if you're in recovery, just being abstinence from an addiction is not recovery. It's not even recovery from codependency. It's about moving from those behaviours that disconnected us from ourselves, and into learning those behaviours that will connect us to others. Uh, we use uh, the Healthy Mind Platter of Dr Dan Siegel, you can find that online. We use that in our Healthy Lifestyles lecture here now and I also mentioned there that, that for you guys that, are, that, are, that know that you need that comprehensive life change, then uh, looking up Dr Patrick Carnes' work about his uh, 30 point sort of competency building plan of recovery, it's one of those wonderful tools out there. Uh, he, he has just released a book called Facing, uh, Facing Addiction and then uh, Recovery Zone 1, 2 and 3 are workbooks that he's got. We, we will be working towards bringing those into some of our programs here but by all means uh, I always want people to walk away from a webinar with something that you can look up. So, uh, you know, once again, I, I, I hope that uh, some of this information is helpful. As I said, the Soothe Contain Move On is just a regulation tool. There's a lot more to it when it comes to learning affect regulation at depth. But I think what we know in recovery now is that if I'm going to start this journey inwards, when I get triggered, I'm going to need to have something that can relieve me of the symptoms of that trigger. And so, uh, for you folks out there that are listening to this live, if you've got any questions, please use the chat option to, to just uh, throw a few questions through. Uh, I might be able to answer a couple before we've finished. I know I've tried to cover a, a lot of uh, information. So we've got one question here. I'll just try and get the gist of it. Uh, will you send out a post the slides pertaining to the stages of recovery, please? Yeah, look, I'm sure we can, uh, Evie. Um, uh, I'll uh, make sure that, uh, that 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 Sam and we'll we've got the email addresses here of folks that are registered, so we can send out these slides. Um, they always ask me to make sure that I've got these slides prepared, and then of course with Sam right, right I was busily looking at this stuff today because I'm. I'm always learning myself uh, around uh, this recovery. So those three stages uh, that we, we sort of focus on in our PTSD programs is something that I found really helpful too. So yes, we can send them out. Um, any other questions uh, for, for folks out there in the audience that are live? Um, Okay, we'll send them next week uh, with the video link, so we, it'll be it'll be made available. So Sam's just informed me, will be it'll be made available on our alumni page on the website, so you'll be able to the, the slides will be up there with the video of what you're seeing uh, me present tonight. Um, so I suppose there it's it's as Pia said, it's the the trudging the road to happy destiny. Uh, this mental health is 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 sort of choosing reality at all costs, and and so if you're out there and you're on this road to recovery, uh, if, if 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 at times this you know I know for myself this developmental trauma just felt like I'll never get better in my relationships. That that as peer outlines in Breaking Free, it feels like it gets worse before it gets better because you finally start to really see the depth that this thing can be uh, in inside of us. Please stay with it. Don't give up five minutes before the miracle happens because because the reality is uh, um, walking forward in recovery we do get better our brain starts to heal from these complex recovery techniques we learn and and uh, and we do learn to change this 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 uh, derailing that can happen from that post-traumatic stress. So it's, uh, I, I've been thoroughly excited in the last three or four years with the the, the way that uh, the psychiatrists like Bessel and Dr. Alan Shaw and Dan Siegel and even Pia Melody, uh, I, I got to meet her this year and she talked very powerfully about uh, this this functional adult development is is is, is connecting us back to uh, uh, what she calls our soul. That 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 when we go from that disconnection back into connection through recovery that that it really does uh, you know uh, give us those promises they talk about in AA and codependence anonymous and narcotics anonymous and and I suppose uh, it, it allows us to hang that shingle down in our reception that says uh, you know expect a miracle and you are that miracle so uh, by all means for anyone that hears this webinar after the fact off our website please send us any questions the details are in this slide here of how to contact us uh, very always very happy to, to, to receive more questions if we can help in any way please don't hesitate to call and um, I wish you a very good night